go around to schools and, and stuff like that. So our very first trip out of um, quarantine, we had all the main characters there. We had Ray, we had Chewbacca, we had pilots, stormtroopers. They're like, where's the Mando? Where's Grogu? <laughs> All these kids have a whole new generation, a whole new stories, all from what you guys did, and that's great. We love you guys. Thank you. I mean, that's got to be an amazing thing for you guys, right? To have like that type of reaction and to see that. And so, um, you know, you guys keep doing what you do because obviously we love you guys. We have another one right here. Hi, I was just uh, wondering, do you guys get to do like a table read before the episode, like all together, or is it one of those like, here's your pages, you get to some, sometimes it's where we show up and someone goes, did you, did you get a script? Did, oh. you, did you get the real script? <laughs> um, and usually, I, I know for me, most of the, we usually start a day with a rehearsal in the morning, and that would be the closest thing we would get to like a, a table read, is that morning rehearsal. Um, with whoever's directing that day. I don't, I don't know, did anyone have a table read? I don't think so. There was no table, but... Um, <laughs> not in what you would see in other shows where yeah. some, they actually sit around a table and read. No, there's... Yeah, I was seated with uh, Dave Filoni and uh, Brendan, Brendan Wayne, and uh, we were talking about the, the very first scene uh, that I was in, which was the ferryman uh, out on the ice, and all my lines were in English, and uh, so I just was, I just made up a voice for it, and uh, and then John Favreau walks in, it was the first time I was meeting him, and I was super, you know, uh, fan-girling, uh, anyway, um, and so I, uh, we, we went through the lines, and I, I was like, um, this is a speeder, it's a brand new, I assure you, and and John Favreau goes, oh, that's good. Let's cartoon it down a little. <laughs> and uh, and then Dave was like, maybe we should do an alien voice for you know the same character as Garindan in A New Hope. Yeah. Anyway, so but they're very creative and very open to uh, ideas. In fact, they want us to bring ideas. Uh, ultimately, they dumped over it with uh, another actor. But uh, anyway. That was the closest, but it's most of it is like how Barry described, where you show up and they were like, uh, here's your lines, and you have to learn them right then. <laughs> well, and, and Leilani and Arrow, your guys' all of your lines are pretty much interpretive. Yeah, and so, because I was casted for um, season two, and it's true, they, they give it to you, but since we're all so secretive, so the day that you go there, it's like, okay, we're doing rehearsal, rehearsal, and then they can do the script, and it's like, oh, oh, okay. But my, my, you know, later dub, but it's like, it's history, they don't give it to me until the, the start, the, during rehearsal. <laughs> yeah, and that secretive, that's a Star Wars thing forever. Do we have a, anyone else have a question out there they'd like to ask of, of the Mandalorians here? Yeah, up there up front. We'll get that mic over there to you. You know, I, I, I love the fact that like, the fans will always ask things that we never think of. Mando, I have a question for you. Do you feel like Pedro Pes Pascal is like the multiverse version of you that gets to walk around without his helmet and show off his face to all the people, but you are staying true to what the Mandalorian are? Do you feel like there's a little bit of tension there? <laughs> Here we go. You're like the alternate Funko Paul, the one that's unmasked or masked. Yeah, I mean, I was originally going to take off my mask, and uh, Emily was like, look, I told you not to take off your mask, and I've seen her beat some other people up, and um, I didn't really want that to happen to me, so I listened, Pedro didn't, and... Um, she really beat the crap out of him, and you know. Has I, anyone seen Pedro around? Like yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think when the armorer says this is the way, you you listen, and I did. Yeah. Well, and, you know that's funny because you know there we're talking about you know their roles are interpretive, but the Jawas still have roles. 
you obviously you're in the suit it's but you have to be interpretive in some ways right. and then you know obviously misty everything you've done to this point i mean the frog lady has her own language keel is obviously completely different voice that you could probably ever come up with um, so you have to act those hey out there, Nate, what's going on? to that so this is cast soundtrack, of the or is that on the you right have to get out Rosa, and them she's creating the soundtrack lady. to your character? We have uh, Emily Swallow is uh, uh, season the one armor, with Quill, I and then we've got the gentleman who's inside the Mando the suit, more than Pedro Pascal. They recorded on his name right now, Dave sorry. and John recorded Nick Nolte and all of his dialogue tracks like a stuff. few weeks before we started shooting. And... Um, Nick Nolte is brilliant and he gave me three versions of each line which was nice because we would go into rehearsal and I go in as me <laughs> and um, you know do the scenes with everybody um, and then we get a feel for the tone of it and then I'd run to the puppeteering rig where all of my puppeteers were and then we would choose the lines that felt right and they would patch them together, and um, then all four of us would try to blend and mesh together. I wouldn't say the lines, obviously, out loud in that costume, but I would be mouthing them, um, you know, just for timing and stuff while uh, doing everything else. <laughs> but for Frog Lady, it was different. I, John Favreau gave me, you know, English. Um, and I just remember, I was fortunate uh, for season two, uh, I did get an actual rehearsal day with Pedro, and it was good because it was the crash scene in Razor Crest, and it's on an angle. It was super slippery in there. He can't see, I can't see, and we're trying to do this very physical, you know, <laughs> scene. So we did have a rehearsal, and I did speak um, just English with Frog Lady for that, and then. The brilliant D. Bradley Baker did post-production for all of her cute little noises and sounds. And Pedro, like, my one very emotional monologue, basically pleading with him. Um, you know, as you said, for me, there's a lot of costume and a head and animatronics, and so what I was doing underneath was far more emotional, just so that that emotion would you know, come through the costume. And I just remember after the rehearsal, Pedro was just like, jeez, you know, emotional frog, God. <laughs> I was like, thank you, that's helpful. So. <laughs> the emotional frog. <laughs> yeah. We need to make shirts with the frog lady on. So the emotional, emotional frog, frog Pedro Pascal. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Well, we got another question in the back here. Yeah, mine is more of a technical question, kind of. Um, walking around the set, because of the way you are, how did you guys feel? Did you feel like you were really in the environment? And did anybody walk into it? <laughs> did anyone walk into what? The LED wall. For uh, the set, I, for the events. The, the sets, I think anytime they could make something real that we could see or feel or use, we, they always opt for that. So oftentimes, whatever environment you're in, it, it does feel very, very, very real. Um, I know when we're in the volume uh, with the, the screens, when the camera hits a certain angle, it becomes 3D. So there were multiple times for me where I went to sit in a chair or reach for something that wasn't real um, because it, it feels very, very, very real. Uh, I did a scene where I was holding Grogu and we were looking out in the water and from my perspective, it was all real. The waves were moving, the sound's there. So um, I think it all feels very real and they would like to use as little green screen and blue screen as, as possible, I think. I mean, and, and, and that, that screen is amazing. You know, and, and it's things like that. It's like, um, I call it like the Star Wars misdirection. It's always done that way, right? Like every time there's misdirection, there's always something. It's like you think they're going on this path and then all of a sudden it's a sharp line. Well, you're like, wait, what? We went where? We did what? You you killed everybody? At the, spoiler alert, we killed everybody at the end of Rogue One? Were you, what? That doesn't happen. Well, I will tell you this, right? And that is, we're always full of surprises. There's always surprises for everything that comes along in the Star Wars world. And I believe that we have a surprise as well. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to bring 
and introduce to the stage, Mr. Michael B. Michael's back there, I know he is. Where is he at? Baby. Oh, he's over here. <laughs> So, welcome, sir. You know what I love about this, guys? What? Is that we kept this from them as well. They had no idea Michael was coming up here today, guys. You didn't know that? I'm shocked, Aren't I you tell you, shocked. I was wondering you why, why you're you acting. I will gone work for you now that you've been on stage with me. Isn't this the most exciting? <laughs> Yes. I gotta tell you, there's a couple of mischievous Jawas down there. That's all I can say. So, Michael, everyone, everyone here were in masks, right? But your character on The Mandalorian actually didn't have to wear a helmet or a mask to portray your character. And in these roles, I almost think that what you do is tougher for a Star Wars fan to follow because they don't fall in love with the realized characters. They fall in love with the mysterious, we don't know, Darth Vader, I can't see his face. I, you know, I don't know about him and so on. But your character was really interesting and it was kind of a surprise to fans. How did your role for you in The Mandalorian, how did, how did that character come about? Because it's a little different than other roles that you've played. Well, let me just say, uh, first of all, that uh, Doing The Mandalorian was really one of the highlights of my entire life. I was not that aware of The Mandalorian before um, I was approached about uh, working on it, but I had so much fun. And uh, John Favre and Dave Filoni are two of the most wonderful people that I've ever worked for, and they created, I, to be perfectly honest with you, I was not, I didn't know that much about Star Wars, so I just went and watched the first season of Mandalorian, and I was like, wow, this is, this is really, really good, and they, John, they, we had, at one point they had three units working, and we had Robert Rodriguez on the set, or not my set, but there, so I got to visit with Robert. And Bill Burr was working on another set, so he's one of my favorite comedians, and like, that was wonderful. And John and Dave were just so, like, like, I, because I'm the guy, I'm kind of back to like, what about this, why don't we try this, why don't we do that, why don't we have this, why don't we, I don't, why do I have a scope and a shotgun, like blah, 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 huh? Huh? Anyway. and usually, most filmmakers have a tendency to Wow, you know, whoa, <laughs> you know. But, um, and John was kind of overseeing everything. Uh, I got to work very closely with Dave Filoni and just an amazing talent, an amazing mind, you know. He, the, the ideas that he would come up with, they just didn't even have to do with Star Wars, just different movies that made me think, well, I have a storyline for this, or I have a storyline for that, and we talked about it. This guy's so talented, and he's just so nice. It was, it was like I said, it really was truly out of 50 years now, just almost 50 years of working. The, and the thing about working on the show too is the first season was already huge. So when it was announced that I was going to be on it, I got so much attention, more attention than I've ever had in my life, you know, for anything that I've ever done. And I knew that I was going to be, um, and, and Rosario Dawson also, Rosario Dawson was just so awesome, and it's just so fun and beautiful, and you know, I just, you know, um, I hate to sound kind of like a fanboy, but I'm a fanboy of that show, and, just, and, and everybody that worked on it, it was, and it was, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. You know, and, and everyone up here has portrayed that. 
I've heard that from every single person on the stage, that they've loved what they've done and they've been involved. And you talked about Farvo and you talked about how Dave Filoni was just like, such a creative mind and so articulate, and we've heard this with it. And I remember Barry, Barry told us a story about a measurement between your helmet and your collar. Just that, kind of, kind of tell this story to everyone. Uh, uh, this just kind of gives you an idea of how far that is. Well, I, I mean, like Michael just said, like no matter if John Favreau is on set or not, he's like somehow there. You know, he finds a way to be there. But uh, he is very, very uh, specific about his vision, and he and Dave Filoni truly care about you know what they're doing and what we're making and. Um, so I was, we were shooting a scene where I was coming in on a cart with Gina Carano and Grogu and into a village and uh, Bryce Dallas Howard was directing but John was watching on an iPad somewhere else and he stopped and uh, stopped the shooting and wanted them to measure the distance between my helmet and my collarbone because there was too much space and so he wanted to make sure it was exactly right. And uh, a lot of times that's why we do 18 hour days or longer um, because they're, they're going to get it right. And John, he, he knows how to get what the audience is going to love, not what he wants, what the audience is going to love. And I think he, that's a great thing about working with him is he finds a way to, to make that happen for all of us. Did any of you other have an experience like that with John where you're like, yeah, his attention to detail just blows my mind. Is there something that stands out to any of you? He's very detailed. Um, for season one, chapter two, Misty worked with us on that. Um, he's very detailed. Uh, he's very involved. Actually, both of them are very involved. And sometimes they'll like, you'll hear them laughing, like, because we're mischievous. We get into things and. We're on, and we're on the set, we're in the sand and the dirt, and he's behind the camera, and there's some scenes we do, and then he'll be laughing, and they're like, oh, let's change this. Like, he's very, very involved. Actually, both of them are very involved. And the people we worked with, we've worked with Bryce Howard, she's awesome. We worked with um, Deborah Chow, she's, she's great. So it's not just the main ones, the people they put together, the directors, have been awesome with us. It's that, it's that strong supporting like group and everything. And, and I mean, Chris, you've played so many different characters for them. I'm sure that you've had moments or an interaction yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, uh, this is very specific, but Q90, uh, when they told me I would be flying the Razor Crest, I got in there and I was flipping all the switches and I was doing the controls and I was so excited because I was seven years old again. Uh, and um, John goes, uh, Chris, you're a droid, so you're going to be just plugged into the ship, and that's how you're going to fly the ship. Um, and so that little, that little, it's called a scump link that comes out of my hand, and I'm I'm, I'm plugged into the ship. Um, they had like three different sizes of those, and John was like, "No, that one's too big. No, that one's too small. No, okay." And so then they built one right there. Him standing over it, saying, "Okay, it's got to be about this big." Anyway, um, it was he was very you know specific that he wanted it to be a certain size and, and so that it could technically could fit under my you know hand plate and all that. Um, so yeah, he was he's very great attention to detail, but not in a not in a like over like not in a micromanaging kind of way, just in a love of Star Wars because he he wants it to feel so you know classic trilogy. Um, and he really cares about that because he's a fan too and he cares what fans would want to see and so that's how he approaches those details. Well, it seems like he portrays that way to you guys because his fandom and Filoni's fandom obviously comes off and portrays to you and I, I'm sitting up here and I'm sure the crowd is thinking the same thing. We actually see the passion of your interest in fandom. So we just heard Michael Bean tell us in his entire career the most important like thing that stands out is most like excited about was playing that character on the Mandalorian. Like how cool is that to hear someone that we know how long and how you know the type of career that he's had and you guys have all had incredible careers with what you've done and, and to do that. And so I kinda wanna get us to, to an end today, but um, I'd like this each one of you to just kinda share something about the Mandalorian that we don't know. We'll start with Misty. 
She's like, I don't think there's anything you guys don't know. I'm always learning at the conventions things that I don't know. And if you don't know it, we can tell it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, is this one of those tricky ways of trying to get us to reveal something? I mean, it could be. Mm. No. No, I mean, more to the fact of, like, is there something about, like, your character, how you portrayed, uh, something that was involved with uh, uh, filming or something that really stood out as, like, this was a moment where you were like, wait, wow. I mean, I have one. Uh, the first day of filming... Wait, our... I, uh... <laughs> <laughs> wait, I have one. Wait, oh, the, fir uh, uh, the first day of filming on Boba Fett... Um, the Boba Fett episodes had not aired yet, so they led us all to believe that we were just going to be starting on season three. And so we got there, um, and the, mm, let's see, I sit down in my chair, Ming is sitting here, and I see Tamura Morrison in the dark Boba Fett costume doing like Maori, you know, warm ups. And I was like, is that. Django Fett on Mandalorian, and uh, and then and then they said, Chris, I uh, want you to report to set. I go to set and I go down the steps and I'm suddenly in Jabba's palace with Boba Fett sitting on the throne and Ming <laughs> standing there and I was like, what is this? Is the best day ever? I mean, I'm standing in a full Jabba's palace. It was so awesome. And then I realized we are not on Mandalorian anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, yeah, yeah. whisper. The All way. of us have seen the last, the, the after credit scene in uh, in season two, right? <laughs> and if you haven't seen it, that. well, it's too late. You can go watch it again on Disney Plus. Okay. <laughs> See, that's good. Good. It was like a year ago. All right. Well, guys, let's give a round of applause to our cast of The Mandalorian: Misty Rosas, Ellie Swallow, Barry Lowen. Leilani and Ariel Chidu, Chris Bartlett, and of course our surprise guest, Michael Bean. Thank you guys so much for joining us for Space Cowboys, The Mandalorian. Coming up in just a few minutes, Jake the Snake Roberts joins us. Enjoy Unicorn, guys. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for hanging out with us, everybody. Thank you.